Welcome fashion historians. This is a favorite of our in-person classes and we were so excited when this team decided that they would be able to make a video for you in our cyber world. So I'm very excited for you to see this uh, surprise dressing um, in historic costume. What I would like to remind you is during this period that we'll be watching this video, I want you to take some notes. Um, things that impressed you about what you saw, your overall impressions, and did you see anything in these garments that remind you of some of the fashion designs today? Just keep some un uh, just informal notes, and at the end you'll be writing a reflection on what you've seen. And with that, we're ready to go. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, however, whatever time you're watching this at. Um, my name is Selena, and this is Phil. Uh, we will be doing a dressing of the Tudor people that you will see. You kind of have some already dressed up here. Uh, we'll go over some of those and he'll be dressing this one and we'll be explaining from this inside all the way out each layer and how it goes together and what we've kind of learned along the way. Um, I, in my regular life, am an executive assistant. I have three vice presidents that I support on a daily basis. They're great guys, but you know, a little crazy. So kind of to wind down, this is kind of what I do for my hobby. Phil is actually a teacher here at Mesa Community College. Yeah, I teach in the Computer Information Systems Department. I teach uh, programming, web development, database, Linux OS, you know, typical. <laughs> so this also gives him something outside of that computer world to kind of play with. So it gives us a chance to stretch some imaginative, imaginative muscles. There we go. So first thing is we kind of got into this completely by accident. Uh, there was an event coming up and a friend of actually ours that was up in Flagstaff had come down to visit and he was like, hey, we're going to do this event. We want to dress up. I want to be Henry VIII. Um, and he looks to me and he says, do you want to be one of my wives? sure fine okay so I had been wanting to make an outfit from one of the portraits and this gave me the great opportunity to do that and then as I was working on my stuff other people kind of saw what I was doing they asked questions and the next thing we know we have not only Henry and his wives but some of the supporting court actors um, so Phil actually does the uh, Cardinal Woolsey mm -hmm. outfit, which he did not bring today because it's basically a big dress. Um, and he cannot move really well in getting things dressed up if he's in that. I'd be tripping over my skirts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did Jane Seymour, which unfortunately her dress is not here. We didn't have enough uh, mannequins for her. Um, however, she is the third wife of Henry VIII, and that portrait is a red velvet dress. Uh, this is another portrait of Jane, which I did later on, um, and we'll go over that in just a little bit. So with that, um, a little bit of history on the outfits. So this Jane dress is actually earlier in the Tudor times than the one that we're going to be dressing. Uh, Jane was the third wife of Henry VIII. The one we're going to dress is Catherine Parr, which was the last wife of Henry VIII. So you're going to see a little bit of difference. We'll talk a little bit about it as we go uh, when we got the two of them up so you can see that. Um, one of the big things you'll see is that, and uh, she's got a train on her dress. I'm not sure if you can pick that up. Um, but there is a train on this dress. There is not a train on the Catherine Parr dress. We cannot see all of what is going on down below the waist on the Jane's portrait because her portrait stops just below the waist. So we do know that there was a lot of trains being done on these portraits because there is a drawing of the Moore family and you can see that there's trains and that's around the same time that this portrait was done. All of the outfits that you're going to see today are actually recreations of portraits that were painted during Henry VIII's time. We made a point to go back to the portraits that were painted during that time and not ones afterwards because the ones afterwards, there's a lot that were romanticized during the Victorian times, but the Victorian didn't know exactly how the clothes looked and how they went together, so we couldn't really 
find out really what was going on. A lot of these portraits that we used actually were painted by um, Hand Holbein, the Hand younger. Holbein the Younger. Um, even in his own time, he was definitely celebrated as somebody who was an excellent painter and did great on details, which for us in the modern day, not knowing really what they were doing, working off of his portraits is perfect because if we see a seam line or a pin or a tuck or a pleat, we know that that's really what was going on in that outfit. So that's why he's a great thing to use. The other thing is, is it made me appreciate him as an artist even more because when I did the red Jane dress, there is a shimmer almost that's on that dress that it shows up in the portrait. And when I found the red velvet for this dress, I it wasn't quite the right shade, but I didn't know why. That was the best thing I could come up with. So I used it anyway. Well, the Red Jane has a whole bunch of gold work on it, which is similar to the gold thread that's on this. Once I laid that gold thread on there, it did the same shimmer. And what's going on is that the light hits this gold and hits the fibers on the velvet and it makes it shimmer. So he was able to catch this, which is a beautiful piece. So in a little bit about this gold work, so this gold work is all hand done. There's no way to do this by machine. I tried. I did this, this piece here, which is both of these sleeves, and this under panel here. The green or the red Jane also has a bunch of this gold work done on it. Um, there is no way to do it on a machine. Um, and basically what this piece of thread is, is it's an inner core of cotton and it was wrapped with, a, well, it's not gold here, obviously, um, but it would, looks like Christmas tree tinsel that was wrapped around that inner core. And that's exactly how that thread was made during that time period. Their inner core was wool or silk. Their outer core, which looks like Christmas tree tinsel, was real gold. Obviously, that's not what I have. I don't have the pocketbook for that. Um, but this is made in the same way. So we've had to make some adjustments when we were creating these outfits because there are things like that gold that it's not possible today, either because it's not being made or because we don't have the pocketbooks to afford it, to get the actual pieces that they were making at the time. One of the biggest things is fabrics. Um, a lot of what they were probably using is a wool velvet or a silk velvet. Um, these are cotton velvets. Um, wool, the silk velvets today are not at all what they were then. They're a lot thinner um, and they don't have the body. The other thing is, is that they don't wear really well. Um, we were very lucky when we first started, there was not a lot of information out there, um, but a couple years after we started getting involved in this, there is a group in England called the Tudor Tailors. They have a great website. They have a Facebook group. I highly recommend if you are at all interested in this kind of stuff, look them up. Excellent books too. Yes, excellent books. Um, they also have patterns and stuff like that. That was not out when we first started. Um, but one of the things that they were able to do, because they actually met while they were working at Hampton Court, and they were actually able to do a lot of research on how things wore over time. Silk velvet does not wear very well. Um, now, also, at, not only did they have different velvets, but they, this is not a dress that there's wearing on a regular basis. They're gonna wear this a few times and then it gets handed on and handed down and handed down. Um, these outfits, like this one here, this one's actually a newer one, it's about two years, three years old now, um, but I've worn it several times. So this Henry is one of the original ones that we did. So this one is about 12, 15 years old now, maybe older than that, I think it's 20. Anyway. It's been a while back. Yeah, it's been a while. I still remember <laughs> when Fergus was trying to cut the fabric and he just couldn't because it's 40 bucks a yard. Oh no, that was me. 
Well, you ended up cutting it. Remember, he was going to, but he just couldn't and right. cut it. And then he made you cut it because he just yeah. couldn't. It, it took me a day to sit there and have somebody cheering me on because this is silk. Uh, this is actual silk velvet or silk brocade type fabric. And it was, one of them was 40 and one of them was 45. Um, yeah, it took a little bit before I cut into that. Um, but anyway, so these ones here are a Henry VIII outfit. Um, that would actually be worn over the top of this. However, it's a little hard to see the details on this, so we put it on a separate one. All right, so one of the things that um, has, this whole thing has led to a whole bunch of opportunities for us that we would not have had if we had not started this. So what started as a, hey, we're going to a, a party, let's get dressed up, kind of turned into something that none of us expected to do at all. Um, we have been able to do presentations at the Phoenix Art Museum. Uh, when they had a Da Vinci exhibit, they had us come in um, because that's around the same time frame. They had some stuff that has happened over at the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies at ASU's campus. Um, we've been involved in several uh, projects with them and different you know, event nights and stuff. Uh, we actually were invited to go to England to do a presentation at Sulgrave Manor. Uh, Sulgrave Manor is the ancestral home for uh, Charles Washington's family, or George, George Washington, sorry, George Washington's family, um, you know, our president of our great United States here. Uh, so it was very weird to, as Americans, be going to England to teach English people how English people dressed in their history. Um, but people were very, very welcoming and wonderful, and we had a great time. Uh, we will be doing another presentation that will have some pictures from that um, trip. Also, we were able to go to the National Portrait Gallery and some of these outfits, uh, there are the original portraits are there. Um, there is a portrait of the Cardinal Woolsey, which in the other presentation, we will have a picture of, you know, our lovely teacher over here, Phil, in his Cardinal Woolsey, along with his actual portrait. Um, we actually were able to pick up quite a few of these portrait pictures, which is amazing. If you ever get a chance to go to England, I highly recommend going to the Natural Portrait Gallery. Also, Nottingham, because the lady from the Tudor Tailors, one of them is there, and they were wonderful and opened up their shop and was able to discuss some of these outfits. And because of their um, research, I actually have made some changes to this dress. Uh, this is the dress that actually went to England um, because it doesn't have a hoop. So one of the things in the construction of these outfits is not only are the fabrics different and the items different, however, we're also in Arizona. So we are in a completely different type of environment that these outfits were worn in. So we've had to make some adjustments for us to be able to wear these here in Arizona. So as we're going through these dressings, I will go and talk about some of the adjustments that we have made that are not period accurate. Um, however, we've had to make those to enable us to wear them in Arizona. One of those things is the hoops. So if you look in at this dress here, this Jane, she does not have any hoops in her and she would not have had any hoops in her during her time period. Um, that didn't happen yet. Uh, they would have had several layers of wool petticoats underneath, which gives it some of the poof that happens on this dress. Because we were going to England and trying to get hoops on the plane was going to be very um, problematical, then I went ahead and made Jane in a period style. Now for the red Jane, which is the red dress that I wear here and was the first one, we actually had to make an adjustment. So in period, you have something that's called a petticoat and a petticoat or a, and a farthingale. A farthingale is a type of a hooped skirt. Um, we have, there's different styles of them. However, this come forward, is a hybrid. This, we call this a petticoat. And the reason for that is because a petticoat, basically, this is what a petticoat is. It is 
just a top part here that has this skirt and they would have worn this along with another thing they called a petticoat coat which is just a, what you would think of as a regular skirt which just it doesn't have this top it just has a band on there so you'd have this petticoat All right, so the first thing that any lady in the uh, Tudor time period would have done when she got up in the morning is probably take it off her night shift and put on her day shift. So this is what is called a shift or a chemise. Um, the one thing is, is like think about today's time, if you say like everybody, both Phil and I are wearing a shirt. However, they're clearly not the same kind of shirt. Well, they kind of the same thing with chemises and shift. It's like the chemise shift is kind of interchangeable, but they're not all exactly the same. Um, so this is something that would have been put on first thing. It's the thing that's up against your skin. It's usually made out of linen, sometimes wool, but linen is usually the one that it's made out of. Um, linen and wool is what a lot of the fabrics that are used during the Tudor times because they were locally available. Things like silks and satins and, and brocades are coming from other parts of the world, so that is usually more of an upper class type of thing. Now, our stuff is upper class because we're recreating portraits, which right there means it's gonna be upper class people. However, everybody in the Tudor world would have been wearing, wearing a shift um, or an undershirt for the men uh, because this is the thing that is washed the most. This is what is catching your body oils, your sweat. It's kind of protecting you from the fabrics and the fabrics from you. They're not showering and bathing like we do today, um, but they are changing these things out. One of the things actually to note is that they did do an experiment um, and they have found that if as long as you are changing this underwear on a daily basis, then, and, and doing basically like a washcloth wipe down, then you're still gonna be fine you're, gonna, you're not gonna be all stinky and smelly. I mean, obviously they didn't have deodorant, but um, it's not like these are you know, people that are rolling around pigsties uh, because of the property of this linen. Now, of course, a peasant wouldn't be wearing the fine linen that a queen would be, but they're still gonna be wearing these under chemises and stuff. And these are still what is gonna be um, washed on a regular basis. Um, linen actually uh, holds up really well uh, to rough washing, which is what they were doing at the time. They're boiling their fabrics, they're you know beating them and that kind of a thing, which is not something that a velvet can handle. handle. So the velvets don't get washed on a regular basis, these chemises do. So the first thing she's gonna put is this. Now obviously this is not made for this mannequin. It'd fill out a little bit more, but hey. Um, the next thing would be in period would be the petticoat, which you saw your teacher try on. However, we are using our pettigale. Um, this pettigale is again the adaptation that we've made for Arizona. So if we can go ahead and get her put on. This gives us the floof that we need um, that the other layers would have been doing when you had several petticoats. this okay. so and as you can see these kinds of clothing the style of clothing would have been done by upper class because you cannot get dressed by yourself in this the other thing is is this is a good ah, display of why people would want to be serving queens and kings because this is not something you can do by yourself you're going to have one or two people that are going to help you and this is private time with this upper, upper nobility. So this one is a queen. This is the time for her ladies in waiting to chat with her, get to know her, hear what's going on in the upper circles, influence the upper circles, you never know. So the people that are serving and dressing queens, her oh. sleep, are not going to be peasants. The people that are serving them are people that are just underneath them in the social ladder. This is not a time where there's a college necessarily that everybody's being sent to. Their training is being sent to court. These are sons and daughters of nobility that are coming to serve upper nobility and kings and queens if they're lucky enough. 
This is where they're getting their political training, how intrigue works, you know, who is the people to know, that type of a thing. So being able to be a lady in waiting to the queen or to a um, man in waiting to the, a groomsman to the king, you know, this is a time that they get private time with these monarchs. So the next thing that they're going to wear after this is called a kirtle. So this is actually a piece of clothing that was in high debate at the time that we first started. There was a lot of debates on whether or not this was actually a separate piece or if it was just a trim that was on the overdress. The first outfits that we made did not have this kirtle in it. We're thinking Arizona, let's cut down on some layers, let's not do this in our dress. However, we quickly realized that there was a problem. We don't have the dress here today, but there is a dress that was done for, um, it's a recreation of Mary Rose Tudor, which was Henry's little sister. It is the wedding portrait of her to Charles Brandon. Her sleeves weigh about four pounds a piece, and they are encrusted with a pearl design. When we, and it kind of, because of the weight of those sleeves, it exaggerated the problem. And the problem was, is that when you have these big sleeves here, and they all did at this time, and you got this fur, there's weight here. We could not keep these shoulders from falling down. And we couldn't figure out why. We recut the, the thing, you know, we did this whole bunch of different ways. We went, you know, did some studying with some theater people to see how they're doing things, and we just couldn't get it to work. So then we're like, okay, well, obviously there's a problem here. So we tried it without the kirtle, so let's try it with the kirtle. And as soon as we put the first one together with the kirtle, it was like a light bulb went off. It was like, it had to be a kirtle. So that's kind of one of the things about the difference between just reading about history and actually trying it out. And I believe the term was... Experimental exp archaeology. There we go, experimental archaeology. And that's where you learn that, yes, you can sit there and read and read and read, but until you actually try it, you're never going to know on some thing if it's actually going to work. And that's exactly what happened with this kirtle. We could not make it work without this kirtle. So while there were still debates in some of the academic circles, we knew that there's no way that this happened without this kirtle because it's an integral part of this outfit. Later on, they found out that it actually it's now kind of everybody agrees that yes, there was a kirtle. So before we put the kirtle on, I do want to explain a little bit about this. So you've got um, hoops in this. When we first started trying to do this, there we used quinceanera hoops. They're here in the Southwest, they're easy to find. This was another experiment that went wrong. We could not get the front of our skirts to open up. If you look on Jane over here, you've got this beautiful front piece here and we couldn't get this to open. Didn't matter what we did, that how we cut the skirt, it just wasn't working. So when we went back and looked at, by this time, some of the research was coming out, um, and there was a reproduction that the Tudor Taylor people did, going back to a um, book that was written by Juan Helsega. He was a Spanish tailor. He had made a book for basically his students. The, there's not basic information in this book. This is not a how-to book. He expected that his students already knew the basics. So you kind of have to, if you look, and you can get copies of that book now. Um, some of them are rather expensive. I was able to actually lucked out and got a copy um, for about 50 bucks. Uh, if you can get a hold of that, then I would definitely do that. But uh, Juan Halsego wrote this as a tailor's guide to his students. And one of the things that was in there was a pattern for a farthingale skirt. And if you look at this, sideways, you'll see that there is a, a little less hoop in front and there's more of a curve in back. That is not how the hoop is cut, that is how the skirt is cut. There is a flat piece here and there's gores on the side and then there's a wider space in the back that it enables this metal hoop to curve out a little bit more in back than it does in front. Now we use metal at the time they're either using whalebone or rushes. 
or willows, that type of a thing. We used uh, metal because, well, you know, we have it and it's a lot more durable and we kick these around a lot. So you get a lot of abuse. Yeah, if I remember right, what they called whale bone was actually the, uh, like the baleen of the whale, the cartilage. Yes, so whale bone is not a bone. It is the, when a whale is eating, they have this cartilage that comes down that basically sifts the water through their mouth. And that's what that is. Um, you cannot get real whalebone now, legally, <laughs> so don't try it. Um, there was some whalebone that was done in here. There's some that is being done in some of the, the um, kirtles and outer dresses. Um, there is something out there today, it's called German whalebone. It is a synthetic whalebone. Um, I did get a chance to take a class from a gentleman uh, by the last name of Luca in Italy, and uh, he has actually been able to get a hold of some actual whalebone from the uh, Victorian times because he's got some actual Victorian corsets that have it in there, and he's played with that along with the whalebone that has come out of this German whalebone, and it's actually a really good substitute. So if you're planning on doing anything with whalebone, look for that German whalebone. You, you can't get it online. But anyway, um, we use metal because it's easy to get. So one of the things with this is that, now remember, there's, you know, people are busty then as they are today. Um, there's not sports bras yet. So what they're doing is they're using their outfits. Now this doesn't have any kind of supporting in here. This petticoat actually has the start. This side cut here that comes down and scoops under the bust, it actually starts helping to isolate this bust area because they're looking for, you're not talking about the Renaissance Fair where you've got overflowing busts, but you want it more towards the front and a little up. And that's what this starts doing here. It kind of starts framing this bust area. Without this side, then especially if you're a bustier person, then this is just gonna kind of go off to the side and that's not the look that they're going for. So this actually is an integral part of this whole look. So when you're designing and looking at these Tudor things, one of the things is, is you have to keep in mind is that each piece actually is not alone or doesn't stand alone. Everything interconnects and interacts and works together to make the whole thing work. These are not people, I mean, unfortunately, we tend to kind of look back at, you know, people in the his, past history and think of them as, you know, oh, well, they're stupid, they didn't have this or they can't do that. In a way, they actually were much more knowledgeable about their everyday clothing and their everyday life than we are today. For example, in the Tudor time, they pretty much all knew how to make soap. I don't know, how, well, actually I do know how to make soap because I've looked for it, but most people do not know how to make soap. These people did. It kind of goes along with their clothing as well. This is one of these things. This has to happen for the rest of the, the next layers to look right. So when you're building these things, you have to keep each layer in mind as you're doing the whole thing. So the next thing we have is our curl. When we first started doing this, there was great debate in the historical um, academic world on whether or not this kirtle actually existed or if it was a trim that went onto the outer dress. So if you look at this piece put together, the thought was is that this here was just a strip of fabric that was sewn onto the overdress. And so that's why the, the thought was, is that this is not a separate piece. It's just part of the overstuff. Well, when we started trying to do this, one of the dresses that we did um, was a recreation of Mary Rose Tudor, which is Henry VIII's little sister. It is the portrait of her wedding portrait with Charles Brandon. Her sleeves uh, weigh about four pounds a piece because they are encrusted with pearl decoration. And we're talking about here on this dress, there's this fur here. Her, the, instead of it having fur, it had this pearl design. So once we got the pearl design, these are four pounds a piece. Well, the issue that we had is that, if that the weight of those sleeves exaggerated what the issue that we were having was. And that is, is that these sleeves with this big, there's a big part of the sleeve here, this adds some weight 
which keeps pulling this shoulder head down because you've got a wide neckline here. So in order to keep this up, that's what our problem was. Now for this dress, it wasn't such a big deal because these sleeves don't weigh a lot, but we were still having some issues. But it really came forward when we did the Mary Rose Tudor dress because of the weight of the sleeves. We tried everything to get those sleeves heads to not slide down. We even went back and started looking, talking to theater people to figure out how they're doing it. Well, we couldn't, we just couldn't do it. We remade the top of that dress, I don't know how many times. So then we decided, okay, wait a minute. The discussion, the debate is, is there a kirtle or is there not? Well, we've tried it without the kirtle and it's not working, so let's put the kirtle in. So we made our first kirtle, put it on, did the whole thing, and it was like a light bulb going off. It was like, there is no way that these dresses did not have a kirtle. So we had determined very early that these kirtles were an integral part of this outfit. So this is kind of where experimental archaeology came into play in that we can read all you want and you can debate, debate all you want. Is there a kirtle or isn't? If you really try to wear it though, you'll know very quickly there is a kirtle there because of the weight of these sleeves. So the other thing is, is that um, there's also some debate on whether or not there was actual boning in some of this stuff. When we're wearing these kirtles, this is actually, doesn't have any boning in there except for, bring it this way, right here on the sides. And that is because we have uh, lacing in here. And in order to keep this from crumpling, we've got a small piece of boning right in here and a small piece of boning on either side of this, this grommet. Um, and that's just to keep this from sliding down. And that is the only um, stiffening in this outfit, except for in here, there's actually several layers. And when he's putting this on, I will show you because we have a piece that we haven't finished. Um, but this, unfortunately, you can't see it as well on this mannequin, but when you've got it on a person, you can definitely see where this is going to give you all of the support that you need. You don't need to have metal and whale bone and stuff like that in these garments for this kind of look. If you will go ahead and start putting that on her. Okay. And let me show you. So this is one of the kirtle tops. This is the back of a kirtle top. And this is what the inside of this looks like. And you have, this is just a piece of, of uh, linen. This outer part is a piece of silk. And what's backed, that silk is backed by this piece. It's a very um, tough, heavy woven uh, canvas. This is a linen canvas layer. And this linen canvas is actually attached to just a, we used a piece of cotton, um, but you could use it, actually I think this, oh, it's on a piece of linen, sorry. This was just attached to a piece of linen. However, we made sure that you can see right here that this canvas layer does not go into the seam allowance. And that's because otherwise it's gonna be too bulky. So we cut it smaller. However, the piece of linen that it is attached to does go into the seam allowance because you have to have it attached somewhere. But we didn't want markings on the outside of it, so that's why there's those two layers on the inside. And then they're kind of all whipped together, they're kind of basted together here, and then everything is lined with the linen on the inside. So another thing that we found when we were stitching these is, I'm a lazy hand stitcher, and I tried to do it all by machine. And the problem that you come up with this is that these heavy brocades don't work really well um, when you try to do what's called the bag method. The bag method is when you are sewing two uh, fabrics right sides together, you sew around, leave an opening, flip them out, and then you close that opening. That is a method that is actually starts in the Victorian times when the advent of the sewing machine comes into play, they don't have that here yet. 
what you have to do when you're sewing these things together is it actually has to be done by hand because you take these pieces and you turn take this and hold one fold one on the inside you fold this other one on the inside and that gives you two sides that are folded in and you put them together like that and then you hand stitch right in that ditch together and by doing that hand stitching there you can see here where it lays flat if I did this and I did the bag method then the only way to get this to lay flat like this would be to do a top stitch which then defeats the whole purpose and then it shows the stitching on the outside so this whole thing, a lot, we, what started out as a sewing machine, actually we had to do a whole bunch of hand stitching. And it just makes it lay better. Okay, now that we've got this kirtle on, this is going to give her some tightness around this torso area. This gives her this bust where she's going to get a little bit of a, sla a flattening, but it's going to still keep it this way because of this under piece. The other thing is that you can see it gives her a whole bunch of back support. And this is integral because, and very important, because these dresses are very heavy. If you're wearing, if you're not wearing this kirtle, then all of that weight ends up on your shoulders and you end up with a backache, like you wouldn't believe. This gives you nice back support. So not only is this giving us the bust look that we need, but it's giving you the back support so that this whole weight of this dress is now going to be spread over your entire torso area and not just your shoulders. So it means that these dresses can weigh a ton, <laughs> and they do, and, but you're not going to feel it too much because it's the weight is spread over and it makes big difference. Do, do, do. And you're seeing that, as you can see on the side of this, she's got this beautiful fabric in, in front here, but she has this plain fabric in back. This is something that they definitely did. There's a lot of evidence on this, and that's because this is expensive fabric. Keep in mind, this sometimes this stuff is coming from China. It can take months to get there, not a years. So this is really expensive. You're not gonna put this in, piece, in places that nobody's gonna see it. So this planar fabric is all in the back of the skirt where it's going to be covered up with this overdress. So you can see already that we have three layers between her and this outer dress. And this is why this outer outfit does not get washed very often because it's got to go through all of this before it even gets to this. There's a whole bunch of uh, skill in keep, keeping those dresses clean and that's what you know you've got laundresses and stuff that know how to do that but they're more keeping it clean from dust and dirt that's coming on it not worrying about sweat and body oils because all that is getting trapped by these other layers you saw that the petty the chemise has very little decoration the petticoat has very little decoration all of that stuff can be easily washed you only start seeing decoration on this kirtle. This decoration here, can, a lot of times is sewn onto a separate strip of fabric and then attached to this kirtle. So if it needs to get washed, this little strip can get picked off really easily. And then it either can get put onto another outfit or it can just be washed and then put back onto this outfit. But a lot of times you'll see that this was done that way because you see several portraits Especially with Jane, you'll see her in several different portraits and several different dresses, but the same jewelry and the same little bling on here. So, fortunately, we can't fluff her because she doesn't fluff, but <laughs> normally what this piece would do would be, again, to get the bust into this area here, which is really what's needed. We're not looking for an overflowing bust, but you are looking for a bit of a cleavage up in here. So then the last layer is her overdress. That's the heavy one. Yes. Especially with... Yes. So in order to get some of the floof in the back, and they're going for conspicuous consumption. So there is a lot of fabric in this back. And you'll see it more when we get it on her. But in order to get 
this fabric, which I think there's seven yards on this, seven or eight yards on this, in order to get it all into this waistband, it has what's called these big, huge pleats. Cartridge pleats. Oh, right? cartridge pleats. So right here, from one finger to the other, that is one pleat. And they're all pleated in, and then they're just attached at the fold here at the top on the way. And that's how you're getting these big pleats. So let's get Okay, before we get this overdress, I wanted to point out the way that this kirtle gets on is it is laced up on both sides. And there just has an opening here. It's right underneath the armhole. There's an opening here, and that's fine. Because keep in mind that, unlike today, um, their mindset, for, especially for women, was that their main job was to have children. Their uh, most adult life that they are able to have children, they're at some point in pregnancy. Uh, so they need to have clothing that's going to adjust with the change of their body. It's not like today where they go and get a whole new wardrobe when they get pregnant. That doesn't happen because, again, they're hopefully in pregnancy at some stage throughout most of their adult life. So by having this come up the side here and this slit open, it means that as they gain or lose um, belly over here, then this can open or close tighter or looser as needed. So that's an adjustment that's set into this. And again, like the when we did the pedigale, the lacing is in the center front. So again, they can open and close it, tighten or loosen as needed. Chemise is so big, it doesn't really matter. So there isn't need on this. So another thought with these clothing is that this whole pregnancy issue is definitely built in their clothes. So as we put this overdress, again, it's easier when there's a live person. Yeah, I, I could really use some more shoulders, but okay. <laughs> Kind of. Um, you've got to pull too far on your side. Okay. There you go. Oh, hold, can I hold back? Yeah, that should work. All right. So, as you can see, I am holding up the shoulders right along where this poking out of this, the jewelry happens. And that is where the kirtle is. So as soon as he gets this laced in, then we'll go back in and pin this shoulder to this curl that's underneath. They use a lot of pins in their dressing. And this is how we know that there was a curl underneath here. Because all we have to do is put a few pins in here and that keeps this from sliding down and supports the weight of these sleeves. And the sleeves weight is now distributed to the kirtle, which again, it's not just on your shoulder, it's got your whole torso that's spreading that weight around and it holds it. So now a human body would be a lot more squishable than this. So you would be able to kind of squish things around and, and get them to line up uh, better. Also, these dresses are pretty much made for each specific person. And obviously this dress is not made for this dress form. So there's a little wonkiness going on here. But as you can see, it's like we've got these pinned up to this kirtle and that's keeping these sleeves from um, falling down. The other thing to note is that, so they don't have hoops yet for this and they, in period, um, and they don't have bust, you know, like the butt pads yet, but they're still getting that kind of bustled look in the back that you kind of see later on when the Victorians come in. But the way that they're getting this bustled look, instead of having a hip pad or anything underneath it, they've got these those big pleats that I showed you. And those big pleats are helping poof this out. Now, when there's a real person underneath this and you've got some more, you know, hip and tush in there, then that pushes out even further. But as you can see, this is, we're not getting a really huge, like a modern quinceanera, huge skirt look, but she's still got some fluff in her skirt. Now we're doing that with a hoop, which this dress would have had because this is later. Um, for this one, she's got those big pleats in the back that still give her that big poofy look in the back, 
um, but she would have had a couple of different petticoats underneath that would still give her this same look. And if you look at her from the side, you've got more of a flattish front, but a poofed out back. And you see that again later on with the Victorians when you start having bustle dresses. So this is kind of like your first pre-bustle dress. So, but you've got these big old sleeves here, and part of what's going on with this is that they're just trying to show off their wealth. This, you know, everything in this time is about impressing people, and the way you impress people is the what you're wearing. And even using black is a sign of expense because true black was a very hard color to come by. It is, takes a double or triple dyeing to go with this because they dye it one color, then they have to over dye it by, by other colors. And so one of the ways, if you looked at a period piece of fabric when they're buying it, you would see the edge where there would be black with a little bit of blue on the edge. And that was showing that they had to do the over dyeing on this fabric. So getting this deep, rich, you know, true black, that's why you're gonna see a lot of upper nobility in black because that color was an expensive color to get. Especially you put it on top of a velvet, again, you got an expensive color. Um, the furs, they would, this would not have been rabbit fur. <laughs> this is gonna be you know, more of the minks and, and the furs that they're bringing from other places. So she's still not dressed yet. She still has sleeves to do. <laughs> so one of the ways that, uh, oh wait, no not sleeves, sorry, sorry. Um, there's the placard. Oh, the placard. Okay. So, keep in mind. And oops, I will, where, where did you put the pins? Oh, okay. Keep in mind, we're talking about a time frame that women are supposed to be breeding. The one another discussion had been is like, how are people getting into these? Because you're seeing the portraits and you're not seeing. For a lot of them, you're not seeing any fr any facing, any um, lacings. So then the question was, is like, oh, they must be lacing them in the back because you don't see the backs of the dresses. So they must be lacing them in the back. Um, so you see a lot of, especially costumes are now laced in the back because, oh, obviously that's how they did it. Well, no, because when they actually were able to find some paintings, there's actually a drawing done, again, by Hans Holbein, the, junior, the younger. There's actually a dress that is very similar to this that you see both the front and the back. There is no lacing that you can be seen. So then, obviously, that's not what's going on. So what is going on? So what they've got, bring that here, is there's a placard that goes over the top of this. And the way that we know this is that there is one of the dresses that is, I believe it's Catherine Howard, that there's actually fur is this piece, and you'll see fur coming up in between that and this. And this nicely covers this. You wanna go ahead and pin that on? Sure. So, and the way we, and we know that this is either, this is pinned on by at least one side. Now, some of them is, you would have whipped it on one side and then pinned the other side. And the way we know that for sure that there was pinning done on some of them is because in the portrait, let's put her sideways, in the portrait for um, the Red Jane that I recreated, there's actually along the side here, you see, I think it's 14 pin heads. So we know for sure that this was done. We also know in the same drawing that was done for the Thomas More family, that you'll see a few of the ladies that are in this drawing that they do not have the placard on there and you see the front lacing. The reason the front lacing is very important. Again, remember, these are women that are having children on a regular basis. You expand in the front when you are pregnant. You do not expand in the back. So having your lacing in the front means that you can open and tighten this front of this dress to accommodate for pregnant belly. If you do that in the back, it doesn't do you any good. So that's another reason why that this out, way that this is put together is not only important in how it was done, but how it was worn. 
And then of course, when they got really, really pregnant, they'd either take off the placard, which is what you're seeing in the drawing for the time of S'more family, or you're, you just make a bigger placard. So another piece that they will put on this, and we'll have him put on there in a minute, is that as you can see right now, I'm just seeing her little chimney sleeves. Well, a way to make this look different is they would change out either that flat front piece here on this underskirt because they could get another piece of fabric and pin it over the top of this. And they would put it together with sleeves. So these are just extra sleeves and you can see that the little ruff is attached to that. And they did do that, that they are kind of whipped on the inside here so that this could get taken off and cleaned and put back on to either this one or a new dress. And these poofs are also coming, they're fake poofs, because as much as you would love to think that these are long sleeves, this is another, another place where actually wearing it gives you the truth. It does not matter how long you make this sleeve or how poofy you make this sleeve, it will not stay poofed out of these openings. It will always move in, pull in as you move around. We also know we've seen pictures where they actually have these chemises hanging up on a line because it's a launder place, and these sleeves are not overly large. So we know that these sleeves weren't made overly large. So how are you keeping these puffs if the sleeve isn't overly large? The only way to do that is to make a fake puff. And again, that means that you can whip them in take them off, put them on another thing, because this, now this one isn't, this is all done on a sewing machine, but um, in period, they would have been done by hand. This is a lot of work. So, okay, so you've got, we've got this one attached on the inside here, and all that is, is that on the, if you pull up this sleeve, there is a ring, or the other strings here, and there is a ring on here, and that just gets tied into that and then slides up into there. And then that way she can change out her sleeves to make it match this and she can make this basic black dress change into several looks. Now we know that they've done that because in the Jane, the red Jane dress, there's two different dresses. One has um, a cream color on the top and the other one has this dark color. So they're same, same red overdress, same jewelry, no, different jewelry, same hat, same dress. Um, however, this panel was changed and then they changed it out to these sleeves. Now this dress for the red Jane, this, well, this one was done on, that red black work was done on the sewing machine. This was actually done by hand. Um, it needed to be reversible because that's what it is in the portrait. My mom is an amazing uh, seamstress and uh, embroiderer, and so she was able to get the design off the painting, and she did make it reversible. So because you can see in the painting, you see um, she's standing like this, and you see the the inside here, and you see the top. So we know that that's how why it was reversible. Now, one thing, and we can't do it on the mannequin, but I can tell you when wearing these outfits is that you do not stand like this. It is not comfortable. It is the worst way that you can stand in this because it just isn't comfortable. When you look at the paintings, you see the ladies are holding their hands like this. And the reason why they're holding their hands like this is because this is the most natural way to stand in these outfits. Because you've got all this sleeve here that is up against your, your side here, that's why it makes this the most natural way to stand in these. And that's why you'll see their paintings like that. She's still not finished. She, now for the fancy stuff. She's got a belt. This particular painting, this is turn sideways, actually shows her with two different necklaces on. Now there's a way that you can connect the necklaces. Um, for this particular one, we've got one with and one without. If you see the Black Jane over there, she has the same setup. And you will see this kind of double necklace. 
on almost all the paintings. And again, it is just a way to show off that gets stuck. And you'll, it's a weird thing, is most of the time you will see, just like, I think he's tucking, just like Jane here, and this one would be Catherine Parr, as long as, as you can see, is that they tend to tuck, like you've got this, uh, this piece here that goes down into the cleavage. Don't know why they do it, they just do. And then bring the hat. The last piece for her would be her hat. So this, is this light on? Nope, this won't. Oh, let's just do it this way. Here we go. This is what is called a French hood. That is a later outfit than that one is. By about 25 years-ish. So the one you see, the hat that you see on Jane over there is called a gable hood. Um, that was, uh, Henry's mother wore them. You end up with Catherine of Aragon wore them. Um, and then you end up with Jane Seymour more wearing them. And part of that is, you know, like Anne Boleyn, who's in between Catherine of Aragon and Jane, she wore the French hood. She brought that with her when she came from France. Um, they had been around, but she's really what made them popular. And so this is where they were using fashion to make a political statement. Um, Catherine of Aragon wore the gable hoods because that is what her mother-in-law wore. And she was in political black hole kind of thing for a while. Um, and so in order to kind of, you know, suck up to her mother-in-law, she was wearing the gables. So, but she wore them a little shorter. Um, however, then Anne Boleyn comes in, she brings in the French hood. So you have a time period in the court where you have both of these ladies active in the court and people were using their headwear to make a political statement. Those women that were either for Jane or for Catherine or their husbands were for Catherine, um, they were wearing the gables and then those that were supporting Anne Boleyn were wearing the French hoods. Jane Seymour ended up being a lady in waiting to Catherine and very much um, a, admired her. So when after Anne Boleyn died, well, when she's beheaded, um, then in order to kind of bring back that um, people thought very highly of Catherine of Aragon in order to bring back that kind of uh, togetherness, then Jane goes back to these gables. Um, Jane is the last one that you see wearing these gables after her, then it goes back to the French hoods. I can tell you from wearing them that the gable is not comfortable, and so I completely understand why they went to these French hoods. In order to wear a gable, for these French hoods, in order to wear this, you just put your hair up in a bun, and it's pretty uh, light back in here. Your bun just kind of sits in there, and this covers it up. So they're very easy to put on. They're lightweight. They're comfortable, that kind of thing. You can't do that with those gables. So this is what the gable is underneath that. There's this headband here that wraps around and there is this little snood. This little snood goes there and that would be under this as well. Um, this kind of just, you have a uh, thing on your hair and this kind of protects your hat from your hair, your grease from your hair. Um, for the gable, then what would happen is like when I wear that hat, then I will separate my hair in half. I'm not gonna do it because it takes a while but you separate it in half and then like this will be put into one long braid and then braid it pulled up over the top and the other one pulls into a braid and it goes over the top as well and then that gets kind of stitched together and so I have this braid crown that goes here that little snood goes over the braid crown and the reason why that has to happen is because that gable hood is heavy if you do not have your braid crown and you do not have this piece on there that what ends up happening is that hat sits right here on your temple point and right here on your center of head. And I can, in, in about 10 minutes, you get a killer headache that does not go away. <laughs> 
So there's a lot more involved in wearing a gable hood and there's reasons because this keeps that pressure point on the side and your front and this keeps the hair, your grease from your hair from damaging the inside of that hat. So every piece that you're seeing on these outfits is, is doing a dual purpose. It is to be flashy and impress people. It's also the under layers are supporting the outer layers to give you that tour look. So that is our two ladies. Um, we're not gonna undress these guys, but here's Henry over here. And you can definitely see how Henry and our Catherine Parr here would match together in their brocades and silks and velvets and things like that. Um, the guys have it a little bit better in that they're not wearing the big skirts because Henry was very proud of his calves and uh, he always wore these shorter outfits to show off his legs. And he's got this very broad chest that he's very manly and chesty about and therefore he's got these, this is a deep dip on this to show off this nice wide chest. Um, and the way that this one will hook is just a hook in the front. And this one has sleeves that are tied on into the top that he can take off um, if it gets too hot. It also gives him some ventilation under here if it's too warm. The other thing on this is in order to get this front piece that is decorative, he has a side lacing. It laces up the side. And this just means that he can get in and out of this and it gives him a front that is um, flat that he can put you know, all this poofs and uh, gold work and jewels and stuff on there. Um, he would have had an undershirt. We just don't have his undershirt with us today. Um, and for the same reason why there are fake puffs on those sleeves for the ladies, there are fake puffs on here. The other piece that you always know for Henry is that he's got his big manly shoulders, and that's what these are. Um, this has, um, we put metal in there, but they would have had reeds that this has some poof out to keep the sleeves poofed out. Um, but there you go. So I hope you learned something. Um, please, please, if you've got questions, um, we love talking about this. So it is never a problem to ask us questions. Um, our group is um, called FIRE, which is Friends in Recreation and Education. Um, we are always looking for people who would like to join us. Um, we are more than willing to answer questions. If you've got any more questions about how this kind of stuff goes together. Unfortunately, with COVID, we can't open our sewing room right now. But once that passes, then um, we will have open sewing rooms if people want to join us and learn more about exactly how these pieces go together. Um, as a quick note, it took for the um, stitching on the front panel of just the front dress over here, uh, this one, um, it took a year and a half to do the hand stitching on this. It took about another six months to do the two sleeves. Um, so to make one of these outfits, especially the queen's outfits, um, takes about two to three years. Uh, the red, drain took, red Jane took three years. It all depends on how much handwork has to be done. Um, this is after a portrait of Catherine Parr. Uh, she didn't have a lot of jewelry on it, so this one is the shortest one. Um, we had six people working on it, and I think it took us five months to get it together, even without all the jewelry. But each outfit is specifically fitted to each person. So I hope you have enjoyed this talk. I hope you learned something. And please give us an email if you have any questions. And your teacher also knows how to get a hold of us. Thank you.